Welcome back to another episode of Titans Time. I'm your host, Tanner Staggs. Joining me, as always, my co-host, Tyler Staggs. Uh, we've got with us today NFL Network analyst, NFL Total Access host, uh, preseason television voice of the Tennessee Titans, two-time Emmy Award winner, and host of his own podcast, The Helipod, which, by the way, is really good. Go check it out, especially the interview with Mike Vrabel. Uh, Dan Helly, uh, thank you so much for coming on with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks for the intro. That sounded good. Oh, Maybe yeah, sound yeah. Better than I really am. <laughs> uh, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about the Helipod? Uh, you know, what made you just basically come up with the idea and want to start your own podcast? Well, I just figured everybody else in the world had a podcast, so why not start one myself? Um, yeah, I included. had this idea for a little while. I, I, I shot a few pilot episodes um, with a couple of guys that I work with at NFL Network and was going to roll it out. Um, a little bit later, once I found a, a partner to do it with, and once uh, coronavirus hit, um, mm -hmm. all the games were off. I really wasn't doing a whole lot, and uh, I said, you know, why not? Let's roll it out now and give me something to do, and um, we've been really lucky and had some fantastic guests. You mentioned Vrabel. Uh, I took a little road trip um, a month or two ago and, and went down to Florida and talked to, to Warren Sapp and Brady Quinn and then headed up to Nashville and Mike was nice enough to give me about an hour of his time. And, um, and uh, a couple of weeks ago, we went over to Sean McVay's house, the Rams head coach, mm -hmm. and uh, had a great uh, interview with him. A lot of insight. I've known him for a long time since uh, his Redskins days when he broke into the league. Um, I, I'm a D.C. native and covered them for a long time when I worked for the NBC station there. Yeah, uh, I, the podcast is great. I've uh, tuned into more than a few episodes, and I always enjoy every one of them. So. Well, thanks, man. Yeah, it's been fun. You know, I, one of the things that I enjoy doing more than anything else, um, I, I'd have to put calling games at the very top of that list. But uh, when I'm doing shows and we're in the locker room or just sitting in the green room and just talking to those guys and chopping it up and hearing some of their stories from their playing days, I just wanted to bottle that up and kind of bring that to the masses. And, um, you know, I try to make it informational, but uh, I, I just, I want to get those stories that we don't have time to tell, um, you know, on the shows about their rookie years and some of the experiences they've had in their post playing career. And uh, I think we've been able to do that pretty well. You know, there's only been 18 episodes so far. Um, we, uh, we had a good one this week with Ryan Khalil, Cam Newton's former center with the Panthers, uh, who's now a movie producer out here in LA and, um, you know, five-time Pro Bowler. I, I think he'll be a, a borderline Hall of Famer. I think his, his name's going to be up for discussion. So I uh, had a great one with him. And uh, next up is going to be David Carr. Going to go see him in Bakersfield oh, and uh, chat with him a little bit. His, his rookie stories are going to be a little different than most. It was a tough, uh, a tough road to hoe there with the Texans uh, as an expansion team and really no offensive line to speak of. But uh, he's a friend, and I'm looking forward to catching up with him. Yeah, that'll be great. Uh, and, of course, we're – kind of partial to the Mike Vrabel one it's my favorite because you know we're <laughs> Titans fans so I understand I really that I'm a Titans fan you know it's uh I, I would say I'm a uh I was gonna say Redskins can't say Redskins anymore but a Washington <laughs> football team fan because that's who I grew up rooting for and I was it was in the heyday of the burgundy and gold when uh the skins were winning Super Bowls and mm -hmm. um but I have uh over the last four years doing the Titans preseason games and uh, I just can't tell you how much I really uh, appreciate and love everybody in that organization. Mike Keith, who is the, the voice of the Titans, um, could not be more accommodating in trying to help me, uh, whether it's gathering information or just answering questions in general about the organization. Um, he has been unbelievable. Jim Wyatt has uh, been a lot of help as well. And it's been really fun there. I, I, I love the leadership there with Vrabes and John Robinson and um, all the way up to the top. You know, they're, they're, uh, able to kind of do what they need to do and uh, operate relatively autonomous, autonomously. And uh, obviously any of the big decisions they need to run past Amy Adams Strunk, but she, she has uh, been nothing but supportive for them. And I am uh, quickly, quickly becoming a big time Titans fan. And, and I expect big things for this organization um, now, I was going to say in the future, but, but right now. Well, that's definitely what we uh, like to hear. And, you know, he touched on that interview with Vrabel. And to me, one of the best parts of that interview was when you uh, talked to him about 
uh, how livid Belichick was on the <laughs> sideline in that playoff game. And, you know, we were watching that game and, you know, we seen it happening. And uh, my wife, she's actually a Patriots fan. She was born oh, in right? Boston. Yeah, she was born in Boston. So I, I'll give it to her. She sticks with, you know, the team that she grew up on. And, uh, you know, we were giving her a hard time about it. And, um, you know, just looking at like the – longevity and the success that Bill Belichick's had with the Patriots. Do you see Vrabel being able to do that with the Titans? I hope so. Um, I think he's a fantastic football coach. And um, I just think Nashville, I'm not just the Titans, but Nashville itself as a city is, is a great fit for Vrabes. Um, And I, I just, I hope that they can – you know how the NFL is, man. You have a bad, you have a bad couple of years, and, and they can just clean house. And I, I don't see that happening anytime in the near future with the Titans. But the NFL is a fickle, fickle league. You can get a couple of injuries. And I, I tell you, the one thing I worry about is anything happening to Ryan Tannehill right now. I, I covered Logan Woodside in the AAF, and I, I think he has some skills and some talent. But, you know, the one thing the Titans had last year – was a backup quarterback with NFL experience, that being Ryan Tannehill. And we saw how that played out when they had to make that change from Mario to Tannehill. I don't think that would play out the same way moving to Logan Woodside this year. So you got to cross your fingers and hope the $118 million man can stay healthy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we're, we're definitely doing that. Um, you know, we've kind of talked about it. And when talking about the backup quarterbacks, we wasn't really sure who we would rather have if something did happen to Tannehill, if it'd be Woodside or Cole McDonald. You know, do you put the rookie in there, let him see what he can do, or go with the guy who already knows the system, but definitely don't want anything to happen to uh, Tannehill? Well, I think here's, here's the situation, and this year is so different than any other year in the history of the NFL. Uh, rookies, especially rookie quarterbacks, uh, are going to struggle this year more than they have before because they just haven't had the on-the-field work. There haven't been the OTAs, training camps getting ramped up. There's not going to be any preseason games. Um, I, I saw Cole McDonald a little bit in college, but I can tell you right now, I would not want to throw a rookie quarterback who was a seventh-round draft pick out of Hawaii into the fire right now. I mean, I would, I would roll the dice with Logan Woodside and, and see what happens. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think uh, Tannehill's had a great productive offseason. Uh, I'm excited about where this offense is headed. A.J. Brown, um, w- one of my buddies at NFL Network, James Jones, predicted that A.J. Brown could could lead the league in uh, receptions and yards this year. That would so. be pretty awesome. <laughs> uh, you know, he got off to a slow start last year, but once he got going, you saw what he did in those last six games, man, over 600 yards. And, you know, what, what he had, six catches for over 50 yards last year. Um, obviously had a connection. With Tannehill, you know, he's talked about um, how fond he was of, of Marcus Mariota. And I think that game where uh, Tannehill came in and, and, and Mariota wasn't playing well, A.J. was so angry almost at himself that he got a penalty because of that. But um, it's this is an explosive uh, offense. I love the addition um, of the App State running back, Darrington Evans. I'm hoping that, that he can do some things for them offensively. Um, I think you have to lighten the workload a little bit, a little bit on Derek, but not too much. This is a volume guy, right? He gets better as the game goes on. So you certainly want to have him toting the rock as much as possible. But um, I I think Darrington's a perfect uh, change of pace back for him. Getting some Titans memorabilia from a trusted site is a win, right? We'll make it a win-win by going to titanstimepodcast.com slash fanatics and shopping through our fanatics links to get your next favorite piece of Titans memorabilia while also supporting the Titans Time Podcast. That is titanstimepodcast.com slash fanatics. You touched a little bit on uh, kind of the NFL, the off season, uh, and how much, how different it's been than anything that I know I've ever seen in, in my lifetime. Uh, what's kind of the state of the NFL right now? Uh, lots of college conferences are kind of shaky if you're right now on whether or not they're going to have their season obviously the NFL uh is a little different but how do you feel about the NFL season well I don't think that barring an absolute catastrophe I don't think there's any way that we don't see um 16 games uh, in the in the NFL this year I mean I'm 
absolutely that's convinced that's going to happen. I think the big question mark is, you know, uh, several teams, uh, the, the Wa Washington being the most recent, I'm just struggling guys with not saying the Redskins. So that's why I'm stumbling <laughs> all over myself. But uh, Washington, the most recent one to announce that they're going to be playing, playing the season without fans. Um, I have been saying all along that I thought that there would be teams with fans in the stadium that they would um, space them out and maybe have 15 to 20% capacity. I felt like the luxury suites, a lot of these teams would be filled. Um, that's an easy way for them to pay some of the bills mm -hmm. uh, because you can social distance and have everybody in their own suites and limit the capacity there. Um, but I, I don't have any doubt that the NFL is going to play a season. I think there's just too much on the line and it's very different from college because these are, these are paid professionals. Yep. It's very different when you don't have regular students on campus and then you're asking um, student athletes to be there playing football. That being said, I am very much pro having a college football season. Uh, I, I feel like the safest place for these athletes to be is in that environment with the best medical care that they can possibly have. And uh, I'm really hoping that, that uh, you know, the SEC and the Big 12 and some of these other conferences that are kind of waiting things out will go on and, and have a football season. And I, I, think, that, I think that we're going to see at least a couple of conferences play. This is going to be interesting. I mean, college is crazy right now. You know, what, the NCAA has said absolutely nothing. What happens when these kids from the Big Ten say, we want to play this year? we got one year left. You know, mm -hmm. these seniors and fifth-year guys, and um, are, are they able to transfer and play right away? You know, we're, we're a month away from, from football, uh, maybe a month and a half away from football on the college level, assuming that some of these conferences play. Um, things are really turning upside down here. It's, it's, it's been fascinating to watch. Um, I, I'm I'm curious to see that uh, you know if any of these conferences kind of reverse course or some of the teams like Nebraska who've said that they want to play like how that's going to go down. This is we've never seen anything like it before. You guys are young, man. I'm old. I'm probably twice your age. So I, in my 45 years, I've never seen anything like this. Do you think that that's a real possibility? Like a a player from a conference that has already announced they're going to cancel their season and then say the SEC comes out, says they're going to play. Do you think you could see a lot of those kids trying to transfer and get immediate uh, eligibility? Well, obviously that's not what the NCAA wants or a conference yeah. like the Big Ten or Pac-12 wants because those conferences would be absolutely ravaged mm -hmm. uh, if the SEC teams and, uh, you know, Big 12, some of these conferences that could be playing come in there and, um, you know, grab up all their best players. So. Uh, I don't think that's what the NCAA is. They're going to do everything they can to not let that happen. But, but I don't know, man. That's a, that's a great question. And that's one of those things. It's, it's so fluid, this pandemic situation. The rules are constantly being edited. Yeah. Uh, the Big Ten announced their schedule and then four days later decided that they weren't going to play this season. It's just bizarre. And I actually, I know they're taking a lot of heat. But I feel for these university presidents and these conference commissioners, everybody's trying to do the right thing. And I, I think one thing that many people forget is that everybody wants to play football. They just don't want the liability hanging over their heads. And that's understandable. Yeah, I mean, like you said, it's understandable. They're, you know, these guys want to play. And, you know, for me, I'm also thinking, how does this play into – like next year's draft uh, for the NFL, because if you have some of these conferences come out and say, all right, we're going to play a season and they have guys that are going to leave to go to the draft. And then if these other players in conferences that don't play, uh, don't get to transfer and play right away, but you know, they're in their last year of eligibility, you know, how does that work for them? I mean, are these, NFL teams just going to have to go back and look at the previous season. And, I mean, for those college players, you know, maybe they didn't have the best season, you know, and that's why they come back for another year. So. Or some of these guys, uh, I called an Oklahoma State game last year. They have a great running back in Chuba Hubbard. Um, they have an outstanding wide receiver that missed last season and was looking forward to playing this season and playing his way into the first round. And there's a lot of guys like that all over the country. So they have to make a decision. These – college athletes do whether they're going to stay and play another year because they're obviously not going to burn eligibility this year 
if some of these schools try to play a spring season, an abbreviated spring season with six or eight games, do they risk injury and play in the spring? And could it be like baseball where the College World Series is going on and Major League Baseball has a draft right before it starts? Mm -hmm. um, I can't see that happening in football because I can't imagine that these guys with NFL potential will want to risk injury um, days before the draft. Right. And you might can shed some light on this for me, but one thing that I don't, don't understand was the NFL's decision to cancel the, the supplemental drafts. Um, I feel like right now uh, this is a, a, as good of a time as ever really for someone to – a college player to want to take advantage of that supplemental draft? Well, normally the NFL does what's best for the NFL. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons you're not going to see the, the draft moved until July because they can't wait until July, assuming they're able to have um, organized team activities and mini camps next year. They're going to have the draft when they normally do. Uh, they might push it back just a little bit. Um, I think the reason they didn't have the supplemental draft is because they would have been overrun, just inundated with guys. And I think that they were just doing college football solid there. Um, it, it's just, we've never seen anything like this before. And I just think that they made the decision to cancel that because it was, um, it would also put a lot more stress on the, the general managers and uh, the guys who are going to be responsible for drafting these kids. Cause there are going to be a lot of names there that they may not have scouted nearly as heavily as they did, you know, in the first place. Yeah. Kind of shifting the pace here a little bit. Um, you know, we've been on Clowny Watch pretty much all of free agency. Um, you know, how likely do you think it is that Clowney ends up with the Titans? I'd say 50-50. <laughs> the prob I guess the, the, the problem is that I don't know – you know, I thought initially the Patriots, but I don't think he's a great fit with the Patriots. You know, the Jets have some room. Um, the, the Jets, I think, are also looking at uh, Logan Ryan as well. Um, this I can tell you that if, if they could make that work, they, Vrabel told me that they just they wanted to get a look at him. John said that a number of times, that we don't, we're not going to sign him before we can bring him in, and they can't bring him in right now. Um, so uh, my question would be, can't we get a physical from an independent doctor? Um, yes, but that's still not the same as, as their team physicians taking a look at them. Yeah. Um, so 50-50 is kind of a cop-out answer, so I'm sorry to do that to you guys. <laughs> uh, you know, but um, I, I think, man, this defense, which is already really good, um, you add Clowney to that, uh, they, they could – just, I mean, up front, just some, some monsters, you know, if, if Vic Beasley can get right and Daquan Jones and Jeffrey Simmons and, um, you know, Harold Landry and, uh, you know, these guys coming off the edge, you add Clowney to that mix, that's nasty. Yeah, you know, we, we agree with you there. At first, you know, whenever free agency started and everything, Clowney's name was thrown out there. And, you know, we were just kind of looking back at, I guess, production last year and what he had with the Seahawks and weren't too impressed. But then after going back and really looking at it and just seeing the impact that he has on the game, you know, we were like, all right, yeah, you add him to this defense and, uh, you know, that could put us over the top. And, you know, speaking of Vic Beasley, you know, we are, we're wondering what's going on with him. You know, we were, we were excited whenever he was first signed because we thought, you know, hey, get Beasley and then possibly add Clowney to this as well. And, you know, we're looking good. And then he doesn't report to camp right away, which, you know, I think the reports were that he had a, a death in the family. And, you know, if so, uh, condolences out to him there. But then he comes in now and doesn't pass his physical. So, you know, we're just kind of wondering, you know, what what is going on with him? Well, I, I, I think it could just be a, a conditioning thing. Um, you know, they want to get him in shape. And some of these guys, uh, you know, Derrick Henry and, and AJ were working out nonstop. You could see it, you know, all over their yep. Instagram feeds. And, <laughs> uh, you know, maybe Vic Beasley didn't, didn't uh, attack the offseason like some of these other guys did. And, you know, Vrabes and the staff just want to see him get in shape. 
um, before they have them really taking part in everything. Um, I, I, to me, the biggest question is what Vic Beasley are you going to get? Are you going to get the Vic Beasley that led the NFL in sacks and was an all pro, or are you going to get the Vic Beasley that had, you know, five sacks the next season and eight sacks last year. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm sure that I'm sure the Titans would take eight sacks. Um, I mean, heck you had Landry led the team last year with nine. So you add eight to that. That's not too shabby, but, um, I know they would really rather prefer when they're paying them almost $10 million a year to get that all pro Vic Beasley. Well, I, I mean, absolutely. And if I would honestly, which I mean, I'm sure everyone would rather him come out and be the, the Beasley that led the league in sacks. Um, but if he does, you're looking at the potential between him and Landry there the first time ever since they became the Titans that two players have had double digit sacks, which would be huge for the team. Yeah, I, well, you guys know, I, in, in my mind, that the two most important positions in football are the quarterback position and, you know, those guys coming off the edge. You know, you want to be able to get to the quarterback and pressure the quarterback, and, you know, that's game-changing stuff right there. Mm -hmm. And when Beasley's going and he's right, he's a game-changer coming off the edge. And um, you know, that's why you just – it's dreams of grandeur, right, if you could sign Clowney too. And just don't – Clowney, he's doubled so often – and, yes, his sack numbers have never been good. They've never been good. But I think back to a game I did uh, – it was probably two or three years ago. And we had Frank Gore as our post-game guest on Thursday Night Football come to the set. And he was just exhausted. And I said, Frank, you didn't run that much, man. You only had about 14 carries. And he's like, man, I had to, I had to block Clowney the whole game, man. I was chipping on him. I, every, I, I, he, was, he, was, he is an absolute monster. Yeah, Clowney's a freak, and he doesn't, he doesn't get to the quarterback as much as you would like, but he makes the offense account for him, mm -hmm. which is almost just as dangerous. Yep. Um, this is kind of a question that we ask everyone that we have on, uh, whether it be, you know, Titans player or uh, whatever. Um, what's your favorite memory or story, uh, in your case, from your time with NFL Network? Wow, there's a lot of good ones. Um, favorite memory or story? Well, you know, I'm a Tennessee grad, and uh, I was on the field uh, for Super Bowl 50 in San Francisco between the Panthers and the Broncos. Um, I graduated with Peyton, a huge fan of Peyton, and uh, that wasn't one of Peyton's best games, but to see him be able to ride off into the sunset with a second Super Bowl ring and to be there for that um, was really cool. Was really cool. Um, another story that just kind of sticks out in my head was, I think it was my second year at NFL Network. And uh, one of our analysts is Willie McGinnis, the, the former Patriot. Mm -hmm. um, one, of my, one of my closer friends, I would say there among the, the former players, um, we went to Patriots camp. It was the year that we went to Browns camp and Patriots camp. And the Browns had just drafted Johnny Manziel. So that was the only reason we were going to Browns camp because they were doo-doo. They hadn't done anything <laughs> the last couple of years. But, you know, Johnny football was a big story. So we started, though, in Foxborough. And I remember we checked into the hotel and Willie said, uh, hey, I want, to, uh, I want to go work out. And I'm like, all right, cool. I'll, I'll go with you. You know, shows in three or four hours. We, we have a little time. And uh, I, I said, where, where are we going? He goes, well, we're going to the facility. And I said, there, we can't work out there. Training camp's going on. He's like, dude, we can work out there. You're with me. <laughs> I'm like, all right. So they had one of the equipment guys pick us up, and uh, we go to the stadium. The Patriots facility is at, at their stadium. And uh, we kind of go through the bowels of the stadium, and there's another equipment guy there, and he, he hands us a stack of clothes like we had just enlisted in the army workout clothes, you know, <laughs> shoes, uh, the shorts, the shirts. Then we, we had a bar of soap and a towel so we could take a shower in the locker room. And we go into the, the coach's locker room and we're getting all dressed up in the gear. And I, I just looked down and I'm wearing all this Patriots gear. And I said to myself, I said, man, if I see Bill Belichick and I'm wearing all this Patriots gear and he's going to be like, who is this Jagoff coming in to work out at my facility wearing all my Patriots gear? I go, I'm, I'm literally, I'm, I don't even know what I'm going to do. I, I, I think I told this story on the podcast one time. I like, I, I would, 
I was afraid I was going to crap my pants if I ran into the belt. <laughs> so we go in to the workout room and lo and behold, if the first person I see <laughs> isn't Bill Belichick and he looks at me and I look at him and he looks over my shoulder and thank God Willie was standing right behind me and he introduces me and Bill's like, I know I watch. And <laughs> Willie's like, it's okay, Bill. He's one of us. And so we go into the office and I just, I'm a fly on the wall. I don't say a word. I literally listen to Belichick and Willie tell stories for 15 minutes with the head athletic trainer. And after 15 minutes, the trainer said to Willie, you guys ready? Let's go. So we went and worked out. He put us through a whole workout. And then Bill came out with the other trainer and he was working out while we were in there. And then while we're working out, in comes Gronk and in comes Edelman. And in comes Matt Patricia, who was the defensive coordinator at the time. My head's just on a swivel. I'm looking around and, you know, I went from, you know, host, anchor, reporter to just fanboy, you know, and I'm talking to these guys. And apparently I was talking to Gronk and Edelman for a little bit too long. And Willie Conson taps me on the shoulder and he's like, that's enough. No, no more, no more questions. He, Cause Bill's overdoing his thing but he didn't want Bill to look over and think that I was like interviewing these guys in the middle of their workout session. So we got our workout in and um, then we went, uh, went and showered up and we we're getting ready for the show and walked through the locker room. And if it wasn't Tom Brady, just sitting at his locker all by himself and we walk over there and he gives Willie a big bear hug. And, you know, he won three Super Bowls with Willie and Willie was yeah. one of the OGs on that team. One of the leaders of that defense with, Teddy Bruschi and Richard Seymour, and just a tremendous defense. People forget that those first three Super Bowls weren't won by Brady. They were won by that defense. And they go way back. And Willie's like a big brother to Tom. And we sat there for 10 or 15 minutes and just chatted and talked to Tom about, you know, he just built this $40 million mansion in, in uh, L.A. with Giselle. And he sold it. And uh, who did you sell it to? Oh, Dr. Dre. You know, he just did his <laughs> new deal with Beats and, you know, he was looking at the house and we were going to move to Boston. So we sold it to Dre. I'm like, oh man. He goes, yeah, it was hard. He, 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 I built this beautiful pool out back and he just, he just ripped it out because he wanted to put an underground garage for all of his cars. So we put all that hard work in the building the house and Dre just changed everything up. And so we're wrapping up the conversation and I hear some hooting, hooting and hollering in the background. And it was, uh, it was Gronk playing wiffle ball in the locker room with a ball of tape. And I can't remember who it was that was, was pitching the ball. It might've been Dante Hightower and Gronk was just letting it rip, dude. He looked like, like Mike Trout taking out ceiling tiles. And then all of a sudden they go, Oh, boss is coming. Belichick walks through. Nobody says anything. He goes all the way through. They start playing wiffle ball again, taking out more ceiling tiles. So that was a, pretty good like pull back the curtain you know during camp get to talk to the guys and something that um, I wouldn't have been able to do without Willie and that was mm -hmm. the only reason that uh, you know get that kind of access and um, that was that was definitely probably my, one of my biggest fanboy moments at uh, at NFL Network there's so many man like there there I was so lucky um, to be able to do so much early on there they had a um, I don't know if you remember that movie with Kevin Costner it was draft day yeah. um where he was the GM for the Cleveland Browns and they were um, having a kind of a launch press conference for the movie. And uh, I got to MC that and, and hang out with Costner and Jennifer Garner in the green room. And I used to have a huge crush on Jennifer Garner when I was young. <laughs> that was pretty cool. But uh, yeah, there've been a bunch. I, I, that's probably more than you wanted, but uh, there, there've been a bunch. Oh no, we oh, like to hear awesome, about, man. you know, all these great, you know, all these great experiences. Uh, you know, that's awesome. You know, um, talking about being like a fanboy in there, me and my wife actually got to go up to uh, Franklin this past weekend and went and seen uh, Keith Bullock's coffee shop that he opened. Oh, he has, and, he has a coffee you know, shop I, in Franklin? Yeah. He does. Uh, Just Love uh, Coffee McEwen, I think, is uh, what it is. Okay. And – I know it's just love coffee and you know, I wore my Keith Bullock Jersey up there and uh, we went in, ordered everything. And then we come back to the table that was uh, closest to the door. And I'm looking at all the newspaper clippings that they have laminated in the tables. And just all of a sudden uh, 
behind me, I hear, man, you know, we're going to have to take a picture. And I turn around and mine went blank because I see Keith standing there because, you know, he's my, he's my all time favorite player. Stud. Yeah. I'm like, okay, this, this is happening. So, you know, got a picture with him, got him to sign my Jersey and told my wife on the way home. I was like, all right, we got to stop and get a frame for me to put this Jersey in. And I was Which like, is right behind and I also have to buy another. Yeah. It, it, it's right behind me here. And I got to buy another Keith bullet Jersey now. Cause <laughs> I can never wear this one again. That's awesome. That's, I love those stories. I, you know, that's one thing that, um, Luckily, I've been able to, to do this since I graduated from UT, and um, I, I'm always a fan. You know, I always love talking to these guys, and uh, it's a job, but it's, it's a job that, that I enjoy, and hopefully I never have to get a real one. Um, you know, I made this transition uh, five or six years ago to, to call in games, and um, I'm hoping to do a lot more of that. I've been doing a lot more of that the last few years as opposed to the studio stuff, which I still do, but... Um, you know, to have the opportunity to do the Titans preseason games and then do some NFL and college stuff with Fox and um, do some Conference USA games with NFL Network. And uh, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun, man. I've been very lucky. Going back to your story. Which, oh, yeah, for sure. The, the Patriots story is just – I thought that was great. But the only thing that's going through my mind, if there's two people that I don't want to work out in front of at all, it's Bill Belichick and Gronk. Well – I'll give you another one. It was Julian Edelman. That was the guy that was the most uh, impressive to me. And um, am I allowed to swear on this podcast? Go for it. Okay, Go for so, it. <laughs> so the other part of the story was that they were doing, um, they probably had like 110 pound dumbbells and I'm on the, uh, I'm on the treadmill with Willie and we were doing little interval runs, you know, one minute off 30 seconds uh, on and whatever back and forth and I looked behind me and and Gronk and Edelman were on this incline bench press with 110 pound dumbbells and Gronk went first and I think he made some kind of crack like the the weights might be too heavy for Edelman and Edelman got on there and just pounded him out and he said pound for pound motherfucker strongest guy on the team <laughs> pound for pound and I love I loved it I, I love seeing Edelman get all animated when he was in there lifting weights so that was the one guy I mean I mean Edelman's smaller than me but uh he he's he's a monster man that's another thing i was thinking if if belichick didn't recognize you you could have just told him you're undrafted free agent three months later catching balls from tom brady yeah i was just telling him i'm a slot receiver you know yeah. the, 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 <laughs> that's the right white guy in there i think he would probably know <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah man it's it was uh it's been fun you know one of the things is I, i'm i'm looking forward to new blood you know we've been to Super Bowls for the last 10 years in a row and you know the Patriots have been so many that it's almost like when they're there it's here we go again same storyline same guys but um, that's not going to be the case this year it's going to be a different story and um, you know and last year you know we we saw it uh, a little different as well with it's kind of the passing of the torch to these um, this this new era of of quarterbacks in the NFL with Lamar and Patrick Mahomes and you know, Russell Wilson's been around for a while, but you got Kyler Murray and, you know, Ryan Tannehill has had a resurgence. So it's been, a, it's been fun to kind of watch this changing of the guard, so to speak. Um, we've only got a couple more for you, so won't keep it too much longer. Um, but we talked about the rookies earlier and the off season, the way that it's been so much different and how the hard that could be on rookies. Uh, which Titans rookie do you think will have the most impact in year one? Well, I mean, it would be easy to say, you know, Isaiah, um, but I, you know, I, I think Dennis Kelly's right there, penciled in at the top of the depth chart, you know, at, at right tackle. Um, I, I like Fulton, you know, the corner out of LSU. Mm -hmm. He's he's battle tested. Um, I think, I think it's going to be Evans though that that you're going to see uh, maybe make more of an immediate impact because I feel like for a rookie running back, it's easier than it is for some of these other positions. Um, you know, assuming he can get a, a grasp of the offense. Um, you know, it's year number two for Arthur Smith. I, I really feel like, you know, you're looking at a, a potential head football coach here and, and he's, uh, he's obviously feeling a lot more comfortable, you know, calling the game now in year two than he did in year one. And, and it was a pretty good year one, I think for Arthur Smith. So yeah, I would probably say Evans. Yeah. 
I agree with that. Yeah, uh, that was kind of my thoughts on that too. Uh, Tanner and I talked about it a couple weeks ago, uh, you know, who we thought would be starting at tackle, you know, Dennis Kelly or Isaiah Wilson. And I told him, I said, for me, it depends on if at the time they were still having a couple preseason games. Yeah. Everything. I said, if they can get in there, have some preseason games, and Wilson can get some snaps – under him and learn the offense you know he'll probably take it over but with no preseason you know like you said I think Dennis Kelly right now is penciled in at the top there and you know like you said Evans he's going to be getting the ball coming in behind Henry so I can see him having you know more of an impact um what player you know not just the rookies uh, but just what player for the Titans are you most excited to see this next season? Mm, that's a great question. You know, one player, I, I don't know if he's the guy I'm most excited to see, but I just love the way that he played on Brown. Um, I just think he is so complete. He can do everything for that inside linebacker spot. And he's, you know, a little undersized, um, but he can drop back in coverage. Um, he can stuff the run. He gets the ball quickly. Uh, I, I love the way that Jayon Brown plays the game. Um, and I, I, I just, and I know this is kind of a, a layup, but AJ, um, I, I was just, they've been waiting to have this type of guy, right? They thought Corey was going to be this guy potentially when they drafted him as high as they did. AJ is the guy. This is the alpha. This is your number one yep. that you've been waiting for. He is here. And not only is he talented, but he works hard. Mm -hmm. he, I can tell you from the first week he was in the building, the coaching staff fell in love with this kid. And they brought him along slowly. They did it right. And I, I'm, a, a, AJ's, he's, he's going to have 12, 1,300 yards and, and, and eight touchdowns. Um, I, I can't wait to see him going. And, and I'm also excited to see Derek, obviously. But I, I want to see Tannehill – and continue yeah. what he did last year in this offense and, and prove that it wasn't a fluke. Um, I'm happy for the guy. It was a, it was a tough road in Miami. That was not a great situation. He battled injuries. He came in, he did everything right. And I would have loved to have seen it work out for Marcus because I don't know that there was anybody more beloved in that building than Marcus Mariota. And he landed on his feet and he's now has the potential to be the Ryan Tannehill of this year you know, in, in Oakland, if things don't go right there for Derek Carr. And Marcus Mariota's right there. You look at these other backup quarterbacks, Marcus got paid, man. Marcus mm. is getting $8 million bucks mm. a year to come in and be a backup quarterback. And Jameis Winston and Cam Newton are, are playing for the league minimum, basically. Yep. So mm -hmm. it couldn't have worked out any better considering the circumstances for Marcus. Um, and I'm, and I'm a, a fan of, of Derek Carr as well. So, you know, I, maybe he never sees the field. But if, if it happens that he gets out there, I, I hope that he balls out. Oh, yeah, you know, we, we do too. I, you know, we were wanting to see more from him when he was with the team, and obviously he had some injuries uh, that he dealt with and everything. But, you know, we wish him nothing but the best with the Raiders. Um, last question we got for you. If you were John Robinson, besides Jadavion Clowney, what remaining free agents would you be pursuing? Oh man, I, you, I just got back from Vegas calling the US. <laughs> I throw out some names to me. I can't even, I can't even think of any because I'm Logan Ryan's the only other one that pops into my head right now. But I know there's a bunch of guys out is, there. Uh, Everson Griffin. Oh, dude, he talk about a man child. <laughs> uh, that guy is is a monster. It, it's been such a weird year in that there's still really, really talented mm -hmm. players out mm -hmm. there uh, who've not caught onto a team. Everson Griffin, wherever he goes. Um, he, he's going to be a welcomed addition. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see. I'd love to see Everson. Um, I don't think there's anybody, though, that, uh, that tops Clowney on anybody's list, um, yeah. you know, in, in the league. And, you know, I, I, think, I think the longer you wait, if you're Tennessee, uh, the more antsy that Jadavion's going to get. And mm -hmm. I think you can sign him to that one-year prove-it deal. And – you know, maybe you could get him for a similar type of deal that you got Vic Beasley for. Um, and you could get those guys to come in and, you know, maybe you're not going to be able to keep both of them, but you keep whoever plays better. Yeah. And I think the familiarity there that 
Vrabes has with Clowney uh, really makes that really makes that a nice fit. Yeah, um, that's all that we've got. We want to really, really thank you for your time. I mean, this has been great for us, uh, and we just really appreciate it, man. Tyler Tanner, thanks for having me, man. I listen. Keep doing what you're doing. Reach out to people. Um, I, I'm I'm sorry it took me a little while to get back to you. No problem. Uh, on Instagram, but um, just keep doing it, man. You're gonna you're gonna have ten strikeouts, and then you're gonna hit a home run and get somebody that you don't expect to to get back to you. But um, I, I love that you're a big time Titans fans, and um, I, I you know Tennessee is a second home for me. Haven't gone to school there, and you know, being lucky enough to do the Titans games now. So it's my pleasure to come on with you guys. Well, thank you so oh, yeah. much. Thank you again. All right, fellas. Take care, man. You too. Yeah,